Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to meet you, although virtually. Um, today, the presentation would be about innovation in forest operations. The idea is that first, we have to define innovation. And uh, as this cartoon makes it clear, innovation is something that has never been tried before. So that's the idea. That's what, what's an innovation. So something has never been tried before, generally in a certain place and in a certain context. What I want to say is that in some things can be innovation to some and not to others. So you can have something that is pretty standard under a certain context or in a certain country, and, but that will still be an innovation in a different country and under a different context. So the concept of innovation for me, it's uh, quite relative. Uh, what I would try to do is to uh, give you a sampler of different innovations within a specific field, which is that of uh, forest machinery. So forest engineering is a rather large field and there are lots of technology innovations, more than we could cover in uh, multiple lectures. So here I would stay with machines mostly not innovation about management, about quality, there's lots of that. Uh, but in this case, I would stay with uh, harvesting machines in particular. So we, we just said that innovation is relative. We have also defined the innovator. There are many different innovators. Uh, in my experience, just watching a different new things appearing regularly on the market and on the, the scene of forest engineering, you have all kinds of inventors. Of course, you have the professional inventors, which are the researchers who very often do applied or pure research and develop new concepts that are eventually transformed into a device and then a market product. But then you have also manufacturers who have a very strong interest, a competitive interest in developing innovation that will give them an edge on their competitors. So of course you also have the manufacturers. And then you have practitioners. It's a huge quarry of innovation, the sector of practitioners, because practitioners, they are confronted with problems. Often they have a standard way to uh, face these problems, but occasionally here and there you see some very innovative approach and that's where often innovation starts. Very often you have a, a, a logger who finds a, a new and very ingenious way to solve the problem. A manufacturer that is a supplier sees that. They will try to uh, adapt this innovation to their product and or buy something from a scientist or some private inventor. So many of the, um, the biggest recent innovations were actually not produced by the big manufacturers. They would come up because there's lots of risk in an early innovation. So very often the manufacturer will come up and buy a patent or an idea from someone that among the many was lucky to develop an innovation that had a shot at success. And then also we have when the innovation is invented. And that's something that you will see recurring in this presentation because um, although that's a bit contradictory, this is a presentation about innovation and history. So history is the past, innovation is the future. Uh, they, they do get along well. And we'll see that there is a very long, often a very long latency time in innovation because we see innovation that hits the market with a big boom, maybe 20 years after it was actually invented or proposed. So we have this reinvention at times. We have innovation that is actually not invented recently. It was invented long ago. It had a shot, but say the, the enablers were not there. The innovation wasn't able to take off. And then uh, this thing basically was mothballed. And 20 years later, when the computers are much better and cheaper, this thing comes up. So that's something that we'll see. Uh, to give you um, an idea, just take an example that is very near to us, winch assist. Winch assist is a big success, recent success, a Kiwi success. I would say last five years, winch assist has been uh, on a, a 
great success story. It's a success streak. Now 70% of New Zealand steep terrain, New Zealand operations uh, use winch assist in some form. There are hundreds of machines across the world. Winch assist is used in uh, especially the west coast of North America, Canada and the US. It is coming into very rapidly into the fast growing plantations of uh, South America. There are dozens of models. Of course, there is some mortality among the manufacturers, so not all the, the early starters are still there, although most are, but new ones are coming. So this is really growing very, very fast. It's a big recent success. But the idea actually is, has a long history. So to the left, you see Washington Ironworks ATH, which was a steep terrain fellow buncher. That was also, not always, but was also occasionally tethered. They will call it tethered, although we don't use it anymore because of a number of conceptual flaws in the, in the term. But uh, this is something from, we're talking about the 1980s. So I think these pictures is 1988. It was also presented in New Zealand by Dallas Hemphill uh, with uh, Lyro in the late 80s, early 90s. To the right, you have MHT, so 2000, much more recent, 20 years later, but still 20 years ago. And that's a fully tethered machine. So this machine was, is, still exists. It's a steep terrain harvester. It can climb on uh, moderate slopes without winch assist, like all machines, even when they're tethered, you, you don't, you don't uh, use winch assist if you don't need to. But uh, normally this machine would work with winch assist. So this is something that has been along uh, for some time. This is another very interesting tether concept. So ju ju just the, staying within the winch assist. So this is the pulley. It's an Austrian machine proposed by Conrad. So basically it's what they call it. It's a, they call it a, a ground-based skyline carriage. So the same, same concept as a skyline carriage. It's moved back and forth by a winch, not wheels properly, but it's leaning on the soil. So it can, it's not flying and you don't need to have a pin tension in order to, to make it functional. So you, we can see here how it works. Have a look at this video and then you will see another slide. Also interesting. You see the machine is coming there, is just giving the, the tree to the processor and then it's coming back up. obviously pulled by the winch because there's no traction on the wheels. You see how it jumped. A very ingenious machine appeared about 10 years ago. Uh, it's trying to be a firm on the market, not so extremely successful, but it might become. This is the same thing 20 years before. Uh, developed in California at UC Davis, and it looks very much like this, the pulley. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not implying in any way that Conrad copied uh, the uh, project by Gail et al, which was published on, I think, the Asabi transactions. Uh, uh, there is no need to do that, to, to copy anything, but just that the idea was already there. Somebody tried, and this is exactly almost the same. You have a grapple, of course, with the technology that is 20 years older, but still the principle is very much the same. So you have this cycle of uh, reinvention or latency in almost all innovations we have. And I will repeat this for a number of other innovations that we'll see in this presentation. In order to organize the presentation, I uh, try to subdivide the innovations I will deal with in different fields. So locomotion, so different innovation for locomotion. Innovation, generally innovations for locomotions are, um, the ones I'm going to present, are designed to, um, to try and limit soil damage. So these are all innovations that are meant to reduce soil disturbance. Then there, are, there is other innovation, that, which is quite actual about saving fuel or energy. 
in forest machines, and then the idea of tele, tele or auto operation, unmanned machines or remote operated, uh, operated machines. So uh, high flotation, especially in Europe, there is a, there's always been for many, many years, uh, I'm talking about since the big machines came to Europe. So we're talking about the 70s. There has been a concern from the foresters about soil disturbance and soil compaction. And normally the answer, so far anyway, has been either cable yarders, but cable yards are, are quite expensive. And if you can go with a ground based machine, the ground based machine always has a competitive advantage. So uh, the idea has been to develop ground based machines with high flotation capacity that are going to uh, compact the soil less and also have better traction so they don't slip as much and therefore they don't mix the soil and disturb it. So this is the, let's, oh, sorry, wrong. This is, okay. Okay. So this is for the 2020, a European project that's, that has been developed within a German European project. This is, you see, it's a, a forwarder with an extra axle and very wide band tracks. So it's not really rocket science, but the idea is to have something that has huge flotation. And again, it's a, it's a significant cost for a manufacturer to develop something even as simple as an additional axle. This is a step forward. So th this is Ponce together with the, with the Snowcat manufacturer, the Italian Prinot, and they've changed the undercarriage completely. So they have this uh, forwarder machine. Let's see if we can go again. So this big forwarder, uh, the Snowcat uh, tracks, and it is a very, a machine that is very light on the soil. That's another European Union project. And then if one wants to go a radically different route, then there is this idea of advanced locomotion, so machines that can walk. And this thing has been around forever, I think. Since the very early 1950s science fiction movies, this uh, fantasy of walking machines had been around for a long time because it can actually work. Uh, probably that is what we would have done if we had not invented the wheel sometimes around the Neolithic. Uh, but uh, what you have here, uh, the upper left is an idea by Kellogg and Brink, and we're talking about the 1992, I think that was pretty much the time. And uh, lower right, you have a concept developed by Umeo University around uh, 2017, so basically now. Still the, the very same concept, these are just concepts, so this is not a physical machine, but that's the idea, trying to find something that doesn't use wheels, so you can put your feet where uh, the soil is uh, more solid, or in the case of the, the Kellogg machine here, on stumps, so the machine will not sink, will not disturb the soil, that's the idea. Actually, a machine like that was developed. This was developed by Plustec, which uh, basically is the design subsidiary for then Timberjack, uh, now John Deere. And this machine was developed in 1995. The very first uh, version appeared in 1995, never made it to a commercial product. It made it to a, a working prototype that we actually tested in uh, 2000, about 2000 within a European Union project. And the machine was, uh, it, it did work. It was just very, very slow because to coordinate all the movements, the, the machine had six legs like an insect with articulations, with uh, articulated swiveling feet. So you had uh, an active ankle, everything controlled by a computer. So a huge computational effort for the onboard computer in order to get this thing moving. And the thing moved and cut trees and process trees, stack the logs and kept moving and cutting more. Just, it wasn't nearly as fast as a standard, much cheaper wheel forwarder. So that's why it never made it to a market product, but it must be somewhere in one of the uh, John Deere sheds in Finland. 
this is another concept, probably uh, certainly simpler and, and more workable compared with the BlueStack uh, prototype, the, the so-called portal harvester. So what you have here is a harvester attached to a, a, a crane on a cab, rotating cab, that can slide along this boom or bridge supported by two tripods. So basically this machine is moving along this beam and it's cutting all the trees it can reach among the cut trees, of course, within a, a rather wide sway. When it has cut everything, it has to cut and it has to move. So the machine will come to one of the ends of the, the beam, position in the center, and then retract the other end. Then you can turn this end the direction it wants to extend it and then launch it out again, like, like a, you know, a bridge layer, more or less, like one of those uh, things that the military used to put a bridge over a river. And then start the cycle all over again. So it's a very ingenious concept. The idea, again, is, is trying to put your feet where uh, the soil can support them. Of course, there would be some very heavily impacted points but uh, these will be few points on the soil, not whole strips like when you drive with wheels. And that, is, that can be a problem because if you drive with wheels, would you create, if there is heavy compaction, you create a, a barrier to underground water movements. Whereas if you just punch points with uh, heavy compaction, just small points, the water can go around them. So you don't really have a problem with uh, flooding of the whole area. The other thing here, you see that the machine is the, in the transport configuration. So two of the, the tripod legs are fitted with wheels. The third one goes to the fifth wheel of a truck tractor and the machine can be moved around. Uh, this is the drawing because it's a pretty cool drawing, but the machine exists. So there are pictures, I think you can find them on the internet. And the machine was shown, I think, 2015, something like that, in Northern Germany. So uh, uh, it didn't make it to a market product, definitely not yet, maybe it will, I, I don't know that. But this is really a very interesting solution because it's not just making tires wide or feeding a machine with wider trucks. Uh, it's a completely different locomotion system that is not as complicated as a walking machine. So I think that in principle, I like it. I like all innovation, but I think that this might have a shot. And then of course, this is completely new. That's a extremely ingenious. That's a, a, a New Zealand development that the monkey. So this thing is actually holding onto a tree while cutting the other. And of course it's still a concept, but engineered as a prototype that is working. And this could be a very interesting concept for a fully autonomous machine, uh, probably still far from making to a commercial product, but uh, definitely that's thinking out of the box. That's really also very nice and interesting. Going to energy saving, uh, we have uh, basically electric and electric hybrid solutions. So the idea of electric hybrid solutions has been uh, around for quite a lot of time. And of course, recently with all the hybrid electric cars, machine manufacturers, forest machine manufacturers thought that they could try and take the fruit. So the very first one to appear recently at least is the EL4 that has been around already for I think five, seven years, something like that. This is a hybrid electric machine. What you have is typically like, you know, these machines um, and a, a diesel motor with additional electric motors and the diesel motor and the battery, of course, and the diesel motor is charging the battery and the battery and the electric motors are giving just the, that boost when you need a power feed. So what you do is that basically you use a smaller motor and you keep it always to the right uh, running regime that uh, warrants a much lower fuel consumption. So a folder like this, um, I mean, at least what has been published says that this machine uses about seven liters of diesel per hour, whereas a standard diesel folder would use, of the same size, of course, would use about 10, 11 liters of diesel per hour. So that's a, a substantial saving. Um, about five, uh, four or five years ago, maybe four more than five years ago, K1 
Tesla developed the very same concept applied to a chipper. Uh, so far, I mean, uh, of course, all these machines have been built. Uh, I don't know if the Tesla machine is commercial yet or not, but definitely they have one. They've tried it and they have shown it at different uh, machinery demos. So that's another machine. It seems to be working fine. Uh, I don't have data, I mean, solid data about the fuel saving. The very early trial didn't show any fuel saving at all. We're part of the project, but I think that it is normal with a prototype that you don't have immediately all the benefits you expect to get. It would be too lucky. I mean, it wouldn't be a prototype. Uh, but that is something that, and it makes lots of sense for a cheaper. And this is the uh, Cummins truck that was presented in Atlanta in 2019, so just one year ago. So Cummins, so someone as big as Cummins is coming with uh, hybrid electric trucks using uh, fuel cells uh, and it, everything is done at home, in home so they want to have control of the whole production of their machine so that that tells a long story about the investment of Cummins so if, if a company like that is investing this much in a hybrid solution uh, they must be seeing a future and probably have better information than I can I would take that as an indicator that this is a it's a segment that will develop very fast in the, in the future. Yardin is actually the Cinderella of innovation, and wrongly so, because Yardin offers ideal conditions for a number of things, including fuel saving. When you have uh, Yardin, very often you have empty return, especially if you are working shotgun, you have empty return of the carriage that is basically. Uh, using fuel for nothing, actually using braking power for nothing. And in, in that travel, you could recharge a battery, which is uh, many manufacturers considering. What they're also doing now, and I think that all uh, yarder manufacturers have some form of electric assisted uh, slug pulling carriage. So you have the E-Liner for Conrad, the Hybrid for Oakleitner, the ASK for Color, and so on. Uh, the idea being that you have uh, an electric motor for pulling out slack instead of a petrol motor, and this motor is recharged with the pulling in of the main line, most often. Uh, some people use, sorry, the motor, the, the battery for the motor is recharged. Uh, um, Conrad actually uses a supercapacitor, which is more effective on short cycles compared to a battery. But there are now, these are nuances. On the general solution, that is that of using idle movements of the machines in order to recharge some form of accumulator and return then this power to the slug pulling motor when that is requested. In any case, electric motors have lots of advantages, especially for heavy machines. So you see uh, most trains are electric, they use electricity. Uh, Diesel trains are used only when you don't have uh, power lines. Even uh, in 1943, during the war, very, very big tanks were powered electrically. This was a 70 ton tanks, simply because the transmission is so much easier. Because uh, an electric motor has uh, the elasticity you don't have in a diesel or petrol motor, and therefore you can dispense of the gearbox or of a complicated gearbox. And for a heavy machine, that is a blessing because if you have like 70 tons running on 700 horsepower, what you have is a transmission that is getting lots of torque and must be uh, adequately sized. Otherwise, you have shearing of the shafts, which is what would happen with this kind of, of, of vehicles. And the solution was actually to put electric engines. It didn't work that well because during the war there wasn't enough copper to produce enough electric engines, but the idea, the concept was the right one. But just a second, that also happened in forestry. So the idea of the shift to electric is not anything that is, today we have hybrid and we have accumulators that are really very effective, but the idea was already there in the past. This is the little no electric skidder. So this is a machine that appeared before 1950. It's a completely electric skidder. 
and it was developed exactly for what I said earlier on, because the transmission is so much easier with electric cables than with shafts and uh, reductions, uh, gearboxes and differentials. You just put electric motors on the wheels. So here you have a, a diesel engine, a generator, and then you would have motors on the wheels and motors on the winch. This is the, uh, what is that? Le Tourneau, uh, is that the name? The cooler, it was something like the, um, anyways, the Electro Skidder. And this machine for a while was actually a commercial product and you'll see here, it's working, that's uh, in Oregon or Washington, I think the machine was from Washington State. So this machine was working in the US in the 50s, fully electric uh, skidder. And we can go to the last part, which is, uh, well, the thing is that, uh, just to stay on the electric, uh, so far the issue is with the cost of batteries. JCB, that builds excavators, among other things, they estimated that the uh, lithium ion battery, current cost, lithium ion, ion battery for a 20 ton excavator will cost battery alone about I mean, over 300,000 uh, New Zealand dollars on a 20 ton excavator that's close to the probably 80% of the cost of the whole excavator without the battery. So, of course, at the moment it is not yet commercial. I mean, it's not that, that competitive for commercial companies to have electric hybrid excavators or similar machines, but with the reduction of cost or new solution that is coming because you see the electric transmission as uh, huge benefits. Now going to the teleoperated, this is the famous beast appeared at least 10 years ago in Sweden. The idea was to have what was then called an autonomous harvester, which was not autonomous. It was a teleoperated, so it was a remote control harvester with unmanned, served by two forwarders. So the forwarders would take turn under the harvester. And then once the forwarder was close to the harvester, the forwarder operator would take the remote controls of the harvester, work with the harvester until his forwarder was full, then shut it down, leave. And by the time he had, it was about to leave, the second forwarder had come with the second remote and then the second forwarder could uh, work the harvester in real time. So the idea was to have a system uh, that uh, instead of using a harvester and two forwarders and three operators would use harvester, two forwarders and two operators and which under um, Swedish salaries are quite expensive. So it would make sense there. It never made it to a commercial product because one is a bit complex. And second, in this case, it's not the teleoperating part that is a problem is the concept that is a problem because this system uh, creates lots of interdependence between the harvester and the forwarder. If the forwarder is not there, the harvester cannot work. And the main advantage, one of the main advantages of the Swedish Katulang system is independence of the different components. So the moment you renounce that benefit, then you're actually reducing the competitive advantage of the Swedish Katulang. And that's why I think this thing partly at least, why this thing has not become a big commercial success in the North. This is um, a New Zealand development, so a teleoperated telebuncher, built, tested successfully. Again, the idea is that if you have to go on steep slopes, especially with a telebuncher, it could be useful and also more comfortable for the operator to be removed from the cab so that the machine can go and the operator can work from a, a more comfortable workstation. Hypothetically, in the future, even from home, if the operator wanted, and especially if there was enough uh, high bandwidth coverage for the signal. So this is another thing that uh, could, be, could happen in the future. Definitely, it's better to work in more comfortable and safer environment than in the cab of the machine, especially if the machine is uh, going on a steep slope. Of course, the perception of the surrounding environment is still quite different because one thing is to be on the machine and the other thing is to be removed from the machine regardless of the many cameras and sensors you can have installed on the machine. But uh, I mean, the concept is this is feasible. It has been done. 
it has been tested, it works. When the situation, especially the economical situation, will make it uh, profitable to ship to teleoperation, then probably that will be the, the way people will go. And finally, the properly autonomous machines. So the thing is that you can have autonomous machines. Of course, there are lots of, uh, of prototypes used in, uh, especially in the automotive for uh, the famous autonomous cars. The thing is that it is quite difficult from the computational viewpoint and also from the sensor viewpoint for uh, a vehicle to be fully autonomous in a, a highly dynamic environment. So if you're driving on the road fast, lots of cars, lots of traffic, there is so much information that the uh, central processing unit needs to process coming from different sensors, that some of which were 2D, other 3D, that it's difficult to get a real time answer from the computer. Of course the computer can process it, but the thing is that if you're driving, it must process it in a fraction of a second, otherwise you have an accident. And that becomes a bit difficult. I mean, it can be done, it's just very expensive. So it's not uh, commercial yet. It will be soon probably, but uh, not yet. However, on uh, low dynamic environments, then there is much more feasible. And that's why you have, these are two examples, the Scania AXL on top, and below you have the Dusan infrared concept. And those are, uh, both are developed for mining, because mining is a place where, okay, the only place where people don't want to go because it's quite dangerous and uncomfortable. And uh, it's a rather simplified environment. The tracks are always the same. There aren't many people or the vehicles around, so it's, it's a low dynamic environment. So it's definitely uh, very um, favorable to the use of autonomous vehicles. And that's why these big companies are targeting mining first. Incidentally, uh, forestry is also a low dynamic environment with simplified paths. And there is the, already a few years ago, a prototype of a forwarder was developed where the operator would drive the forwarder just once on the track and then the forwarder would learn and then would, it would take over for the successive trips. So it's something you can do. And again, I would like to stress the Cinderella role of uh, cable yarders because lots of attention is devoted to ground-based machines, to harvesters, forwarders, to the cut to length system because of course the big companies are there and the, the other companies are not that big. But the others, they, again, they offer the ideal situation, the ideal conditions for um, autonomous or, or automated operation because it's just one set path. You need just to program that path, which is already possible commercially. And basically it's a very simplified cycle. So I think that the others offer, again, great opportunities for, if not full, at least partial automation of operation, and partly that is already there. So I think I'm finished with my presentation. Hope it was interesting. I don't know if you have any questions, I'm here and we'll be happy to answer.